Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Welcome to the show. I'm Lisa Williams. Today, my guest is Dr. Sadie Sheaf. Dr. Sheaf is a licensed psychotherapist and psychoanalyst, board certified clinical sexologist, and licensed clinical social worker. She is the CEO of DQS Communications Healthcare Group in Hampton, Virginia. DQS offers mental health counseling and therapy services for families, couples, the LBTQIA community, adults, and children of all ages. Their goal is to help people learn how to cope with conditions, make quality of life improvements, change relationships, alter behaviors, and in general, feel better about themselves. One of Dr. Sheaf's goals is to positively enhance and improve someone's quality of life based on their desires and their right of self-determination without judgment or criticism. Dr. Sheaf has been working in the field of mental health for over 26 years as a therapist, researcher, educator, and speaker, both here in the U.S. and in Europe. Dr. Sheaf has personally worked with over 20,000 men, women, and children of all nationalities, creeds, ethnicities, and social economic backgrounds. Dr. Sheaf's specialty is sexology, and her clinic specializes in marriage, couple, divorce, work-related stress, depression, addiction, gay, lesbian, gender issues, sex counseling and therapy, anger management, PTSD, juveniles and adolescents, physical, emotional, verbal abuse, grief, attention deficit, intellectual functioning, and learning disorders. Dr. Sheaf stands firmly on the belief that the results of your therapy session should be judged by you to be desirable and beneficial. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Sadie Sheaf. I'm doing well today, doing well. Welcome. So glad to have you on the show. Well, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about the growing number of Black women in business, how we've evolved, and what it'll take to help African-American women in business run successful businesses. Let's get started. Black women have always had an entrepreneurial spirit. From our great grandmothers who cleaned houses for a living and sold fish dinners at churches, to the many African-American women who rose to the tops of their industries, including Michelle Obama, the first African-American first lady of the United States, Sheila C. Johnson, founder of BET, becoming the first African-American woman billionaire. Oprah Winfrey, having the number one daytime talk show in America. Serena Williams, number one in women's singles tennis. Janice Bryant, owner of the largest minority woman-owned employment agency in the United States. And Ursula Burns, the first African-American woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And of course, the list goes on and on. In fact, according to the 2015 State of Women-Owned Business Report, the number of women-owned businesses grew by 74% between 1997 and 2015. The report also stated that 33% of women-owned firms are owned by minority women, and Black females are amongst the fastest-growing group of entrepreneurs in the U.S., it's wonderful to know that African-American women entrepreneurs are the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the U.S. What a great statistic. So it's important that we don't let this momentum die. Now, more than ever, African-American women entrepreneurs need resources available to help them not just be in business, but grow in business. The biggest hurdle African-American women business owners face is that many are first-generation entrepreneurs and they lack exposure to other Black women in business that have successful businesses from which they can glean habits and proven processes from. Let's look at an example of just how important having a role model accessible to you can be. Here is what Jessica Alba, actress and CEO of The Honest Company, said about having someone that you can call on. As far as mentors go, Countless. I was not shy about making phone calls to many people. I've been fortunate enough to know people like Tori Birch and Diane von Furstenberg, and they, you know, got lots of emails and phone calls from me along the way with tears in my eyes. 
saying, I don't know if this is possible. Why is everyone telling me no? What do I do? What does it even mean to get venture capital? What is venture capital? What's a board? Like, I just didn't know all these business terms. And so they helped me understand it. And it's nice having women that you can look to and rely on. Incidentally, her husband, Cash Warren, a Yale graduate, producer, and tech investor, introduced Jessica to his childhood friend, Brian Lee, an entrepreneur who co-founded LegalZone. And the women Jessica reached out to, Tori Birch, who is a New York fashion designer, and Diane von Furstenberg, who is a billion-dollar fashion designer. Unfortunately, most African-American women don't have the same access and connections that Jessica Alba was blessed with. Black female entrepreneurs need a supportive network of African-American women business owners that we can learn from. It's time to talk, share, and provide resources and roadmaps to Black women in business. We need successful mentors to inspire African-American women on their journey in business. I have lined up a variety of successful, prominent, and leading African-American women in business across many industries to share their paths and secrets to their success. They will discuss their journey not only as women in business, but more importantly, how they grew successful businesses in spite of the unique challenges faced by African-American women business owners. Forgive my cloudy voice, but the show must go on. So let's get into the show. So I'm going to jump right in. Dr. Shafe, how do you feel about being a part of this historical time for African-American women in business? I feel honored uh, to be a part of, you know, this piece um, that's so significant to us as African-American women um, about being one of those folks that are in business. Uh, it's an honor. It's like, you know, it's good to stand on the ladder, um, and that's the way I see us all, is standing on a ladder. And it makes it so that my daughter and other African-American women may be able to stand on my shoulders. And I'm glad and happy to be a part of this building uh, of what is needed so greatly amongst ourselves, confidence, support, mentoring, to do the same thing, to be successful in business and see our dreams actualize. Yes, definitely. So a good story isn't a good story until we can understand where you started. How did you get started in business? Well, what I did was I was working as a social worker with uh, the federal government um, for several years. I, you know, will say like most, I had a vision, I had a dream. Uh, I was working as a social worker, working uh, with substance abuse, doing um, uh, treatment, and um, I had an epiphany, and it was when I was pregnant with my youngest child, uh, and I was in graduate school, and um, and it was more or less, it started from a dream I'd had, and what it was was I had a dream, uh, a vision uh, of riding down a highway, and there was this big billboard, and the big billboard had the huge letters, DQS. Now, that was just prior to me having my daughter. I had already decided that her name was going to be Sade. But interestingly enough, in this dream, DQS Communications is what the sign said. I had always had ambition, um, I think, in a way to start a business. My sister, uh, Merlin Jones, who's also my hero, uh, me standing on her shoulders, had a business called Inner Power Forces Consultant as a social worker, helping people in the community. And she was also a first lady. Uh, her husband was a pastor, Reverend John D. Jones and Merlene Jones, and I had the opportunity to go see her in her practice in Syracuse, New York, a bit with some things that she was doing prior to this. And kind of always kind of kept it in the back of my mind, looking at how wonderful it was to see my older sister with us growing up in the South, uh, two black girls from the South, uh, being determined to do something, to have a business, to go get the education and do all of that. So what happened was uh, when I had this dream, this epiphany, I woke up the next day and I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't get rid of the idea, the thought. It was on my mind, and it would not let me rest, and thank God for that. 
because that's when I knew for sure my daughter's name was going to be Sade, and I also knew for sure the name of my business and what it was going to be. Because D is a name, is my son's, my oldest son, first name, Dennis. Q is my second son's name, and S is Sade. That's when I knew for me it was God-given. So it was already determined. And at that point in time, when I had her already knowing it was a vision, I worked diligently outlining things and thinking about how I was going to actualize it, and I made a decision to go ahead and get the name of my business and get my EIN number. And it was she was a, a little bit over five by the time I had did everything and pulled that together, and that's exactly what I did. And I began contracting myself as an individual working with businesses under DQS Communications uh, LLC doing business as Dr. Sadie Shape. Or not, it wasn't Dr. Sadie Shape then. It was doing business as Sadie Shape. Okay. Excellent. Yes. So, Dr. Shape, who do you work with currently and how do you help them? Uh, who I work with, I work with, well, I work in several places. I work with veterans um, in my full-time job. And then uh, in my practice, I work with veterans. I work with active duty service members. I work with the community at large. I work with the LGBTQIA community. I work with the elderly. I work with adults. I work with children. And so I work with women. I work with men. Uh, so I work, I guess, just the community at large is who I work with. And there what we do is we provide psychotherapy or um, psychotherapy, and, and sometimes with me, I do some psychoanalysis, but uh, psychotherapy with the folks that come through the doors in need of help who are struggling with any issue that they are facing in life. And I'm also, um, I also work with students. I have student interns that I uh, have, uh, that do internships, and these are uh, usually African Americans who are looking to come into the field of therapy. So they get to do their internships with me there at DQS Communications. And so I work also with other licensed clinical social workers, other doctors and professors, as well as other disciplines um, there in my practice. That's excellent. I I love that, uh, the internships Mm -hmm. and the interns that you work with. Because it's about giving back. It's about giving back. I do that every year. I always take on students who are trying to break into the field because there's not like a lot of places for them to get the experience and they do it directly under my supervision. And I also do supervision for individuals who are looking to get their license in social work because I'm also a certified uh, supervisor for license in the state of Virginia. And so I also do that in my practice. I help those that are out in the field who are trying to get licensed to practice and I also help those who are coming into the field get the education and experience that they need on the professional side. And on the helping side, I help the community at large. Okay. And so as an African-American woman in business, let's talk about what your path has been like as you've navigated your entrepreneurship. So what can you share with other black women in business about starting, staying, and sticking it through to reach a level of success in their business? The first thing that I would say that has to be, you know, you have to get your vision. You have to know what you want to do. And then you've got to surround yourself with people who have like minds, who want to be successful and accomplish as well. That's very important. Uh, I surrounded myself with people who were doers. And I stayed and I kept myself in the limelight. I kept myself in a way where I was always having to learn, always having to get to know people. Uh, I volunteered for many things. Uh, I spoke every chance I got. Uh, I went to any information they could give me. I went to any kind of conference or or lecture or workshop that could give me information on what I wanted to do. I talked to people that were also in business. Uh, I talked to other African-American women that were doing things like owning salons and different things like that. Uh, Wanted to know what kind of things that they pulled together. I didn't just talk to African-American women. I also talked to other women of other races and other colors, asking them about what did they do to, um, to get it going. But one of the things I found a lot was, as an African-American woman, there was not a whole lot out there. Uh, uh-huh. Not a lot of examples. That's where my sister came in, 
who was such a godsend to have a sister who had already broken into this arena of doing some practice stuff. She was doing it in the church, and she was doing it also in the community, and it also helped, greatly helped me that she was a city manager. So that helped as well because I also uh, – took on the business avenue in my jobs. I was, I was a supervisor. I took on as much responsibility as I could. I, I took additional courses. And so you have to make yourself a open sponge to learn and get everything that you can, anywhere you can, so you can begin to build up an idea of what it is that you know that you want and what you're trying to achieve. And so for me, I wanted to not just have a business or have it for a show. I wanted to be successful in business because I did my research, and that's another thing that I'll tell anybody. You have to read. You have to stay abreast of what's going on. So I read books on leadership. I read books on management. I read books on business. And I, and I looked at the pitfalls of business and what worked for some and what did not work for others. I looked at all of those things. I talked to people in real estate that had businesses. I talked to people that worked with Avon that had a business. I mean, I just got as much as I could. I even talked to other black business owners who were absolutely working businesses, but they were doing different kinds of businesses. But it's still, once you get that, once you understand that, you can work with it. And to also know that I'm always uh, on the job. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So what was hard for you um, along the way? I mean, honestly, think of one of the most challenging times in your business. And what, what was hard and what did you do to overcome it? What was a challenge uh, for me was, you know, having uh, enough resources. Uh, mm-hmm. Because, you know, the idea that you'd have a lump sum of money somewhere or that you'd be able to, uh, you know, step out in your business in that way, that was indeed a challenge for me. So what I did was I saved my money over a period of years. Uh, it was almost about, um, about five to six years. I saved money, and I pinched back, and then I was very thrifty in the things that I did. And I knew that when I opened, I had to just open with myself. So I was working long, hard hours myself. I did not have the other staff. It it was my husband. My husband, my greatest support, was marvelous. I didn't have to pay him and me. We had to get the job done. And so then I worked long hours, and one of the biggest challenges was the resources. That continues to be a problem, you Mm -hmm. know, um, in business is having the resources and building that because it wasn't like I had a parent that could give me, uh, had started a business that could give me so much money. You know, my parents were, um, you know, folks that had raised their families and had did those kinds of things, but no large sum of money to give to me. So I had to creatively think about how to make that work. So I worked for myself, and I saved that money, and I worked three jobs. I contracted myself, I worked for myself, and I worked my normal job. And then my husband was my assistant and my help. And I did that for almost four to five years. On an average, it was nothing for me to work 75 or uh, almost uh, 80 hours a week. I did that. And you had your children at that time? I had my children. Uh, and at the time when I began in my business, I was, uh, I was a single parent. I wasn't married to my husband uh, at that point in time. He was a friend. So then uh, what happened was that as when we became married, uh, the good thing that he had was he had his background in business, and that was helpful. Uh, and it was good to know I could rely on him, and he was supported. Um, my children's father was also helpful. Even as I was a single parent, he was always helpful. He uh, would keep them for me so that I could do the long hours. Even sure. before I married my husband, I went today. So even as I was divorced from my first husband, he was always supportive, always helpful with my children. That was the greatest help that I could have had. And yet I had to work the hours, and I had to make it happen because at the same time trying to be a good mom, uh, I was also in school, still uh, finishing up my doctorate. So there was a lot of things going on, but I, I kept uh, I kept my faith. I had support from my family, and I did that. But those were the challenges because when you're doing it, it's not like I could turn to someone else and say, you know, I'm tired. You know, um, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. You have to be that determined. You can. You have to be determined to stick through it through the thick end of thin. And so I sometimes had to go to family members to get some money sometimes when I was short on different things. Mm-hmm. But I had 
care of, but they were there, thank God, as they could be. And then, you know, uh, working the three jobs. I worked it as long as I could, so it was quite intense. That's a great share. Thank you for your candor. Yes. Uh, We have other black women that have accomplished great successes, like those mentioned earlier, other ones such as Taraji P. Henson, Kamala Harris, and Shonda Rhimes, and countless others. Can you share a nugget to help women that are just starting a business? Yes. Um, One of the most important things that I would tell you is when you've got a vision, write it down. That's very serious. Write it down. Uh, And I not only wrote it down, I drew it. Uh, I always had, um, I drew myself uh, affirmations. And and as a therapist, see, I was always a therapist, so doing that was important. I drew, I wrote it down. I changed my plan 20,000 times. It doesn't matter. And then I thought about, and see, I thought for me as an African-American woman, I thought about what success meant to me. It wasn't about me being successful. It's helping my family, helping the seeds of my seeds, helping my extended family, helping friends, being really involved with helping those that are trying to help themselves. So when I thought about myself in business, I thought about myself as being a resource to others, and that's the way I've always thought of myself. Money is only as good as it can help other people. That's my feelings about money or success. I want to be that place where my daughter stands on my shoulders, my son stands on my shoulders, my family stands on my shoulders. That's what it is. I want to be that solid place. So for me, the nugget I would share with anyone, you got the vision, write it down. Don't, and, ta- and, and think about what you want to do. Take yourself seriously. And when you're beginning to talk about it, you know, initially share it with people that are supportive of you. Uh, it's not necessarily necessary to tell everybody. And sometimes at the beginning you don't necessarily need critics. Deal with people that can actually be positive for you, tell you encouraging things about yourself. And then when you're looking down the road, I didn't look at my business in a way of thinking, oh, I'm starting this business and get along the lines of problems. I was thinking about the future. I was thinking about my great-grandchildren, my children's children. And that's the way I think of everything. I never think in the moment. It's about how I see it and where I want it to go. I think this is a way I give myself to my children, their children's children, and my family. And that's to be a resource. And so for me, I see myself as being in many places at one time when you can make that happen. This business was that important to me, that I'd be successful, and it's that important because I can help 20 people at one time if I can be a resource of some sort, whether it's through my knowledge, my information, my education, and not just to my family and extended family, but to the community at large and even young black women I don't even know. Where I can share a pearl of wisdom, I do. Where I can give insight, I do. And then I give guidance. When I have students, I don't just talk to them. I mentor them. So when they're done with me, it isn't like, okay, you got your degree. I taught you this and I'm done. No. I let them know you can call on me forever. As long as I'm alive and above ground, I will always be willing to give some piece, some piece of information. And I just, and a mentor, a real mentor is with you for life. May not be able to be there all the time, mm-hmm. but you know you can call on me, and I will give you the best information I have. Yes, and 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 that's not easy to do, especially when you're juggling a practice and all the things that you mentioned. But that's excellent. And you know, and I think about angels. I see angels in many places, and that's if I could be anything, I would love to be an angel as much as I can to anybody. Um, to do that, and because I've had so many angels in my life, my life, I, my grandmother, my mother, my sisters. I have eight sisters. Uh, wow. My sister that I was telling you about is a sister that uh, has a practice, but I have uh, a sister in computers. I have sisters that are nurses. I have a sister that's into finances, and I have brothers. My brothers also have been positive for me. Uh, and I've just been surrounded. I grew up in a very large family, a, f- a family of basically 12 of us. There's 11 of us, and then there was one adopted, too. So I grew up in a very large family, and that's where the support and the love, that's why I can never see myself as being successful, just me. It's about all of us. So. Yeah, the bigger picture, the vision. That's awesome. Yeah. Dr. Shafe, what would you say is most important to have a successful business? The most important to have a successful business is to have a vision. 
to have a support system, uh, to be authentic, uh, to be ethical in the things that you do, uh, and to always be able to say, I don't know, if you don't know, to seek out knowledge if you don't know, to look for incredible diamonds in the rough, and to give Mm -hmm. to other people whatever inspiration it is that they need to be the best that they can be. Because I tell you, when you find a diamond and you shine it up, the glare is so powerful, it will absolutely shine back on you. Yes. So if you could share something with your younger self, let's say 15 years ago, about being in business, what would it be? It would be to know number one, that you're going to do this. You, you, you have what you need. Um, and, and when I say you have what you need is you have the capacity to get it. If you can I'm, I'm speaking of your younger self. What would you say to your younger self 15 years ago? About what, I would have said, what I would say to myself 15 years ago is that you can do it. Uh-huh. Um, you're going to be okay. Um, I would say to my younger self, um, you know, keep going the path that you're going. Uh, It's okay to uh, reach out, uh, and it's okay to speak up and speak out, um, and you're going to be fine. That's what I would say to my younger self. Because when you're younger and you're doing things, you have so much intrepidation and so many fears. And I would say to myself, just keep going for it. You're going to be okay. I would validate me. That's what I would do. You're doing the right thing. You're going to be okay. Keep trying. Keep going. Keep doing. Write it down. Yes, I know you're tired. It's okay. It's, 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 going, to, it's going to get better. Yes, those things. Yes. As I explained in the introduction, one of the greatest challenges African-American women in business face is the lack of successful black women role models in their communities, in our communities. So let's talk now specifically about the unique challenges African-American women business owners face. And I'm going to kind of go over uh, very briefly a list and um, just listen closely and whichever one you want to comment on that you may have experienced Um, please do. So I'm going to kind of go over this list. The first is family. They didn't understand your entrepreneurial walk. Friends. uh, You didn't have friends that own businesses that could impart and share and understand what you were going through. No role models. I'm sorry. That's that's one that I'd like to speak on, the friends. Okay. I'm I'm just going to name a a couple more so so we have that. Okay. Um, no role models to call on. Another one might jump out at you. <laughs> um, business terms and, and knowing, you know, how to run a business. Seeking capital. Um, juggling being a single parent or a single woman. Lacking relationships that, um, you know, professional relationships that can help you grow your business. Investing in ourselves as African Americans, many times we don't uh, attend personal development seminars and invest in ourselves. And lastly, volunteering. Unfortunately, um, we are not taught typically in our families to volunteer outside of the church setting. So um, did any of them other than the first one jump out or would you like to speak um, would you yes. like to speak on the um, I'd like to speak on um, three of them, actually. I want okay. to speak first concerning friends. Uh, now, the reality of friends is this. I don't have today, uh, well, I have a couple. I have maybe one or two friends that are seeking to do business. But to have a actual person around me, my sister lives in Syracuse. I lived in Virginia. And my sister was quite a bit older than me. To ha- actually have a person around me that was determined to do what I did, because I was also looking at radio and television as well, that's still a part of my vision in DQS Communication, which is to do that. I was doing a bit of a talk show. I had no one around me to show me. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of uh, even when I think about, you know, it's like I look at President Obama. He had no one to show him. 
you know, he had to get that on his own. You know, he had to pull the pieces together. He's going to be that mentor to uh, 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 perhaps I know in my heart the next African-American that can make it there. However, back to the business of being in business and having friends. I didn't have any friends that I could turn to that knew the struggles of trying to make payroll, that knew the mm-hmm. struggles of trying to not, not it, most of the people I know were talking about paying their house notes. I'm talking about a house note, uh, a, a note for the building, a note for the business, sure. uh, paying in two places, basically running, you, you want to tell it, two households. I didn't know right. anybody that was doing that. So I really had to learn to juggle that. And then uh, I had no one to turn to to say, you know, how do you do this or how do you do that? I had to learn those things on my own. And how I had to learn them was I, too, uh, had to piece things together, and I had to ask questions. That's the place where we as African-American women in business suffer, to look over and see someone that is doing what I'm doing and being able to have some kind of perhaps organization of black women entrepreneurs that are there to help and to assist uh, uh, wasn't there. Uh, and uh, and then sometimes, you know, there's the idea of, you know, not you know, not only are you struggling, but sometimes you don't need to tell you struggle too. And you may not necessarily be comfortable mm-hmm. with who you're going to share your struggle with, because you know, as African American women, we are taught, you know, most of the time, if you're suffering or going through something, to be still, be quiet. That's not necessarily something that you share. Right. You know. Unfortunately, that's what, right. That's what we're taught. You know, mm-hmm. if, you know, if you have a need, try to fill it. If you can't figure it out, we're also taught to not to sometimes be so open about what we need. And that's a scary thing because I had to do some of that. I had to learn to step outside of that, to step outside of that quiet place that we're taught sometimes to suffer in. Uh, the other place um, is seeking capital, um, you know, owning a home and having things and doing stuff, you know, no matter even if you're, uh, if you have a pretty good credit score, you can only get so much capital, so much money. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know where to go. Um, and so I, that's why I knew to start with myself. I started with me in my business. I was my first employee, and I made a decision to hire myself in 1990. Actually, I made it official in 96, but I hired myself in 1995. I hired myself, and before I even turned it into that, I went out contracted. Then that's when I, that's when I let DQS become full blue. So I had to start with me because I had no one to go to to tell me, you know, how to get started up. There were small business organizations and those things, but to meet my need and what I was up against, I didn't have that. Those are real. Those are real shares. I appreciate you um, sharing in, in several categories because those are real challenges that business owners in general face and African-American women, you know, some of the things that you spoke about are truly some of those things that we are challenged with. It is, and I will tell you, for example, I mean, sometimes you have to make a decision about what to pay and what not yeah. to pay. Mm-hmm. You, have to, you have to, and you do this and you do that. Uh, to make those things happen, uh, and that's why, you know, I could work me and not necessarily have to pay me, but still I'm building my business and I'm helping people, but I can still, I, didn't, I could take the, the, those funds that I was making from that and do what I needed to do to make my business stay alive, and I don't, and for many years, uh, I didn't pay myself, and, you know, and, 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 I, and I didn't. Because I couldn't. I had to pay the people that were working for me. Sure. And so and thank goodness I worked you had your salary. I worked long hours. Mm-hmm. But if somebody had to be skipped on the paycheck, it was me. Right. That's what I did. And that's what I did. I mean, that's what I did. Because you have to understand, one of the things is that sacrifice is so incredible. You know, you've got to take care of your kids. You've got to put food on the table. You've got to pay your house notes. You've got to pay for your car. Those things have to be done. So then there were times, you know, your saving account go down to one rule to none, and then you, and you use all that up. And then, you know, I was fortunate enough that I had siblings that I could, one or two siblings and stuff that I can call on, but then they got their own lives too. You know, right. so that's tough. 
And then it isn't like we have a lot of people, like I said, that we can go to for money. And then if you are, you have a job and you're making so much money, if you're owning those things, you can't go get a loan. You can't go do those things. Right. Yeah. And you had a different situation having a uh, job, a salary that you were able to support yourself at some point as you were growing your practice. Many yeah, people... and, I, and, I, mm-hmm. and I do. I've kept, uh, I have a full-time job and I have my practice. Right. Uh, uh, yes. Because that's how that's how you have to do it. Because that job takes care of my things, my home, my car. Those things I have to pay. Mm-hmm. The money from the business going to the business, and if someone doesn't get paid, it's me. Who right. doesn't get? Paid. Yeah. So, and for a long time, that wasn't. I mean, just didn't happen. And then in the area of um, uh, in the area of volunteering. Yeah. Um, what I would say about volunteering is that there is so much that volunteering offers. When you're in a place where you're volunteering and someone see you, whether you're volunteering around a place where people are doing a business or conducting a business, they're just, uh, people notice that. They notice that when you're volunteering, you're basically working for free. You're not, you know I mean? You're doing what you're doing for free. And then they have a tendency to want to share something with you. Because as, you know, just as human beings, sometimes when we're in the right place, we know that even when a person is volunteering, sometimes you want to say thank you. How can I show my thanks for what you do? Sometimes that's where you get the opportunity for someone to show you how to write a business plan because yes. you're volunteering with them. And they know that you're helping them. Oh, sure, here, take a look at this. Here's an idea. Volunteering. Yeah, that's very important. And unfortunately, our upbringing as African Americans doesn't tend to involve our parents making sure that kids volunteer at a young age so they're used to it. Yes. And I will tell you something um, that... uh, you know, pretty much for the most part, like you said, you know, when you're doing a lot of volunteering and stuff like that, it pretty much had been, you know, uh, perhaps maybe growing up around the church or whatever. But when you get out here and you want to make a business, uh, you come to understand that, you know, we love church. It's wonderful, but church is also a business that has to uh, take care of itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, that building has to be paid for. Things have to be done. And then if you really want, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to be able to hire African Americans. I wanted to make a difference in my community um, where I grew up uh, in the South where blacks don't have jobs that are in offices. They had jobs in fields and doing other things. And even though many of them went to got education, you know, the opportunity to work in the office, to actually be a person that helped, uh, was not happening as much as it should. So I wanted to hire us value us, value mm-hmm. you have something useful, you matter, you bring something good to the table, not just hiring us as African Americans, but hiring all minorities as well as all others. But I wanted to be the one that could make those decisions and grow business, grow my business in a way to help people in a way that I thought and I knew that they needed help. So sure. a lot of my business is aimed toward the African-American community. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. So, uh, Dr. Shafe, there are many articles online about entrepreneurs and their success stories and challenges they had to overcome, but there are few about the current-day women that aren't necessarily celebrities, but those women that are, uh, they have successful businesses and are doing great things. There aren't stories about what they've gone through and definitely not specific articles sharing what African-American women in business have gone through. So what did you do when you got stuck, overwhelmed, ran out of money, or possibly felt like quitting? What I did was, with all of those things, and I'll tell you, I'm the kind of person that when I made up my mind that I was going to do this. See, my children are the prize. This is about leaving a legacy for them. It's about more than just me. DQS is God-given. That's for Dennis Quentin Sade, and it's for my family and generations to come. I'm, I'm not building a business. I wasn't building a business to run so that Sadie could run it. I was building a business that's a, I'm building a business that's a legacy for my children, to leave them something, because I want to end poverty uh, in as many places as I can, and I wanted something, a, a lineage. 
I wanted something to leave to my children, mm-hmm. and 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 it, and, it, and I and I don't mind working in it and building it. As I have sure. one of my sons, and I've had my sons and my daughter working with me from time to time, mm-hmm. I let them see me do. I didn't say go get it. I went and got it. I went and got my PhD. I went and got my master's degree. I teach. I do. I don't tell them what to do. I show them what to do. Mm-hmm. And so for me, when I made up my mind, because the vision was so clearly given to me about the business, and it came to me, it came to me in such a way there was no denying what it was. So when things got tough, I, I talked to my mom, my mom, yeah. my biggest confidant, my sisters, my encouragers. When I, when I felt like I wanted to give up, they encouraged me. And my husband that I have today, I'm just so grateful for him. And, and for my, my kids around me, my husband is such an inspiration for me. When I am tired. When I say, I, I, you know, I'm paying everybody else, I'm not paying myself, he always reminds me that the day is coming. And so when I get down, I have him. And, of course, he's working with me. When he gets down, he has me. We encourage yeah. each other. That's what we do. And there are days when I'm tired. And I say, okay, what I do about that is then I usually take uh, a little bit, I may take an extra day over a weekend, a day or two, to get some rest. Refreshing. And then I, I mm-hmm. meditate. I work out. I do things to help keep me rejuvenated. I don't only read. I, I read often. I, 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 I'm interested. I'm interested in life and in people. I'm a researcher. Uh, that's what I do in regard to uh, my dissertation, the book that I wrote, uh, which has led me to be one of those. Um, I was the second person in the state of Virginia to get my Ph.D. in clinical sexology at the American Academy of Clinical Sexology, Sexologist, and to be practicing. I'm right now around my area the only practicing African-American uh, clinical sexologist. So uh, I have always been interested in the human condition and human beings, and growing up as a child, I was that way. And that same inspiration, I was always curious. I still am, and it'll never, I, I, I love that about myself. I love my curiosity. <laughs> so That's great. those things in place, I reach out to my support systems around. Uh, I get time to myself. I meditate. I read. Uh, and I also uh, go, uh, I try to uh, talk to others who have success stories. I've been able to meet uh, quite a few people who have been very encouraging. Uh, also, what I do is uh, I give back. I am absolutely convinced that in giving back you get. You can't get anything with your hands closed. So mine are wide open. That's why I take on students in my practice and teach them uh, social work so that they can be so that they can come in the seal. And I I've, I've been doing that every year since my practice has been open. Every year. Okay. I love it. I love it. And it's and uh, it's some, uh, I take them from the African American uh, University, the Norfolk State University, and others. But I take it from Norfolk State University, which is a HBCU, and uh, and that and that's important to me. And then I also um, help veterans. Uh, not only uh, was my um, children's father a veteran, who he just passed away in December of this past year, their father, but my husband is yet alive. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think about that, how, how people are affected. And I was just fortunate to have been a military spouse and traveled the world, and I saw a lot of things. So that's also a part of my repertoire, a part of my information and being brought up in a Christian home, just understanding Habakkuk in the Bible about the importance of writing things down. That resonates with me. Yeah. So what didn't you have when you were building your business that you wish you would have had? What I wish I would have had would have been a mentor uh, in business that had a business that could have showed me some things, uh, could have uh, helped me with a few uh, pitfalls that I had, um, and uh, would have been able to guide me um, at times when I was having to make decisions um, in regard to um, sometimes the location of my business um, 
And I think a blessing has been my husband because my husband's father was a bishop, and that was very helpful. And I'm just so grateful to have had so much around me in the way of resources. But those things that I would, it just would have been a black female mentor. Yes. That would have been, that, if that's the only thing I would have wanted and, you know, to have. And, you know, I think, I don't care who you are as a black female in business, you still want a mentor, even if you have one. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I, uh, a mentor a real mentor, someone that's interested in me uh, and watching me succeed, encouraging me, helping me troubleshoot, helping me with my vision, helping me clarify things, telling me those places where I could grow, giving me guidance about how to deal with things financially, spiritually, emotionally, in all of those arenas, uh, helping me, you know, take, uh, you know, do self-care. That's important. You know, and in this stressful world we live in today, when you think about uh, medical problems and things like that that can be an issue, self-care is most important. That's why meditation, time out, taking care of me is so important because in order for my business to go on, I've got to be alive because there's so many things that I know that I want to do and I'm determined to do those things, God willing. And I want to leave things in a very good way for my children to yeah, take on. It's so and important. Fat- Properly, I'll be around as they take on because I am absolutely going to be mentoring them like I am now, God willing. I um, yes. want to be there so I can leave it at a good point, let them move in, and mentor them through, uh, mentor them through as long as I can. Sure. And I'm going to have to edit this part out, but um, I, um, we're going to kind of have to move through the rest of these questions okay. because I want to make sure that I get your input on, on okay. these. And I'm um, sorry. I'll, I'll, no, no I'll what you have said has been so valuable. And uh, unfortunately, because we do have a limited amount of time, I, I okay. just want to make sure I get your heart and soul on the rest of these. So. Okay. 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 So we'll edit that part out. <clears throat> so let's have a little fun now. Okay. Our, our black businessmen are showing us out. And that's not going to (laughs) work. No, it's not. (laughs) That's right. Tyler Perry has shared his homeless to success story. Eric Thomas, the motivational hip-hop preacher, has the homeless to Ph.D. story. So us ladies, we've got to get our stories out and documented. So African-American women in business have some inspiration when they're feeling low, when they're searching online, you know, to learn what, someone else did to get past a challenging situation. So we need our rags to riches stories. Yes, we so do. My que- yeah. So my question to you, and I'll help you with it, what's your hero story or rags to riches story? Let's kind of, you know, take a moment or two and, and create it. What okay. would you say? My rags to riches story, a little girl growing up in the south, in the deep south, in a place called Bainbridge, Georgia, where there were where I did not see any black business owners except men. Uh, And I saw women in churches uh, growing up. Uh, That little girl that was walking in the South who had ideas and dreams, um, wondering how she'd get there. Um, Yes, encouraged by my parents, but had not seen the big world, had not seen a large city, but knew I wanted more. Um, and growing up uh, the way that I did, kind of, kind of sheltered a bit, and then you know stepping into the a big place where I met people from. When you go to co- you know just in high school, getting to know people, but in college, getting to know people from many different walks of life, hearing about blacks um, in communities and other places that was doing great things, sat and dreamed listening to the radio. Uh, I listened to country music uh, because in my, in my town, there was not a black radio station. I uh, looked at television and saw blacks on stage from Michael Jackson and everybody else and dreamed of success and dreamed of doing something. I even saw music as a way of them being their own boss. I grew up in the South, and I saw a lot of blacks working for, you know, um, whites and such and working on farms and working in fields. I had not seen them uh, in charge. Uh, I was fortunate enough, though, as I got older, to recognize I had uncles that were farmers, 
Brian. But we got we got to kind of pull the story together, real condensed. Okay. You know what I mean? So, rag, you know, um, uh, Tyler Perry, homeless to. Uh, I would say uh, the 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 young black girl growing up in the South, uh, no idea of the big world and what was out there, mm-hmm. and growing up, um, growing up. Um, I would say I grew up poor, but I didn't know I was poor, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, was just determined. My family taught us that education was everything, and so believing in that that I was given, which was education is the key to freedom from everything, um, I was just determined to follow it. That's all. If I could jump in, I would say maybe something like from education to legacy. Yes, ma'am. Because that's what I've, you've been speaking about. Yes, ma'am, from education to legacy, because in go. my community, my aunt was the first African-American to get her master's degree in library science and the first black library and the first black librarian in my community. Okay. All right. Well, there's your, there's your hero story. Yes. So now I'm going to switch directions for a moment. Um, today there is a lot of talk about collaboration. Can you, you know, kind of give me your thoughts very briefly on collaboration instead of competition? Uh, yes, collaboration is, uh, if there's anything I'd say about that's the way to go. When you collaborate, we both can be successful. Uh, not so much competition, but reach across in those areas where I need help, you can give it. If, I, if you have something that I may need, it would be wonderful to have, and if I have something you may need, it would be wonderful to share it. And if we can come together and collaborate on something, for example, um, there was a group that I, I talked about getting a grant. I had the therapy and those things that they needed, and then mm-hmm. they had other things, transportation pieces and stuff like that. Uh, and it was a black male, interestingly enough. Um, but coming together with me having what which it took as a part of the way of completing the grant and him having what it took, coming together and sharing the wealth, sharing the yeah. wealth through collaboration is the, really the way to success. Because in my business, that's another area of success that I otherwise would not have had because we have to uh, understand as African-Americans, we may not have all the resources, but look around. You have others that are African-American that may have the resource that you don't have. That's and right. if you can put that together with yours, you can, create, you can take pieces and make a whole. Right. And, yeah. and one of the things I share with business owners, especially women that I work with, is how you can succeed without having to compete. And you can do that by implementing the power of positioning, leveraging the media, and all of that collectively to build your brand. So you don't have to have your eyes on your competition. That's right. And in being out there in a way where you're inclusive so that others will know that you're there. Uh, um, That is one thing that I've definitely done as a clinical sexologist, you know, put myself out there um, internet, uh, television, and such, and then whenever there are others in the community, like as a specialist and uh, as an expert in that, I have other blacks, uh, other black females that own businesses, and they don't do the specialty. They don't do the sex therapy or uh, treat the sexual issues and stuff. They are clinicians, though. I get those referrals. And then when I get referrals that I think that they may benefit from, I send those referrals to them. And so I don't have to keep my eyes up trying to see what somebody else is doing. I'm putting myself out there in such a way you know what my, what my strengths are, you know what we have, and then we know what you have. And when we can come together and join together, we do. That makes, that makes for a great collaborative working relationship as opposed to being competitive. Uh, I agree. At a time when we don't necessarily need to be. I totally agree. And a couple of closing questions. How do you think we can move forward and turn that growing number, that statistic I shared earlier, of African-American women in business into successful million, multi-million, and billion-dollar businesses? What do you think? What do you think? Yeah. The thing that I think that we can do is do more of this, do more interviewing, um, um, tell our stories, talk about, uh, our, our, our beginnings and where we are today because, you know what, Rome wasn't made in a day. And we didn't get here through jumping through, uh, you know, through anything easy. It has been a test. It has been a trial. Sharing our experience, our strength, and our hope in such a way that those that are thinking about it may be willing to take that leap of hope, that leap of faith, 
that can make the difference. And uh, being that uh, being that a resource in our own communities uh, that we know that we need, because who knows our communities uh, oftentimes better than we do, uh, and 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 uh, and where the holes are and the gaps are, knowing where the gaps are, knowing where the holes are, um, uh, and so then for me it's that, um, and and being open to talk about uh, my pains and my trials, but also being willing to share about the successes in such a way that if you can see it, you can do it. You know, the thing that makes anybody great is not for me to tell you how great I am, but for me to tell you how great you're going to be, how great you're going to be because of the things that we do. And we need to do this so that we can tell other young black females how great they're going to be, just just learning what we learn, standing on our shoulders, kind of in a way, uh, almost like biblical in a way, greater healing will, will you do. And mm-hmm. you pass that on to the ones coming. That's what you can do. Just tell them how great they're going to be. And keep and, that going. And, Dr. Uh, Shafe, what impact would you like to make as an African-American woman in business over the next 10 years? The impact that I would like to make is I would like to uh, be in the, the, one of the greatest employer of African-Americans uh, uh, in my community. I'd like to expand my business, not just staying local, but to expand to other cities, other states, other areas, and then also bringing in, again, not just here in this community, but in any community, because I grew up in the rural south. I wanna, I'm going back there to start up my business there. I'm going to start a satellite there. I want to grow my business there and make the dream come alive, because the black people in that community saw me when I was a little girl. They know where I came from. To go back there and allow them to see this gives another girl hope, a dream, a vision, to know that I grew up in this small town where you grew up. And then to be expansive and to share that and to let them know that it can happen for them as it happened for me. And my vision over the next 10 years is to grow my business in such a way that we're not confined by brick and mortar, that we become national, uh, even international, because with automation, we're no longer limited. And then to take, make use of that automation to do uh, telemental health, uh, especially when we know at a time the world so needs uh, work with mental health, to not be limited by my desk or my office, but to know that I can be on a computer, be speaking to you, talking to you, and get that training, get that education to know how to do this, how to reach out to people beyond the borders of my state, to other states, to the nation. Yeah. That's where I see me going, and to have no limitation, Bec- and then to multiply myself as many times as I can, and that's what automation will allow me to do, whether that's Internet television, radio, I'll be doing radio, television, those things that will multiply me so that there yeah. are many streams of income that comes in that help me grow my business, and then in that way, I, my business can be the great success I want it to be as, a, as others look on to become entrepreneurs, and business owners themselves. That's a great vision. And can you share your five success tips with us? Yes. I would say be determined. Stick to your vision. Stick to your dreams. Write it down. Make it real. Talk to people that are supportive of it. If you can get if you can have family around and supportive of it, great. But if you're going to have friends around and you're going to talk about your dreams, make sure that they're going to positively stroke those things and encourage those things. Be authentic and ethical. Do the things that you know are right. Be committed. Be determined to learn. Be determined to grow. Be determined to get knowledge where you can. And seek it out. Search it out. And not be limited. Automation. Take advantage of it. Be honest. Uh, it's okay to say, I don't know everything. You don't have to know everything. I didn't know everything. Most people don't know everything. And it's okay to say, I made a mistake. If you make a mistake, there's a way back. And you can ask for forgiveness. You can do those things, whatever you need to do. And should anything ever happen in the way of a relationship, you can extend a hand. You can reach across, mentor, and be willing to be mentored too. Never be afraid to ask a question. Always be curious. Ask questions. And lastly, personal growth. With personal growth, take in those things that are going to allow you to open your mind, open your vision, do things to, do, to take care of self. Self-care kinds of things are important. Meditate, 
read, take some time off, take yourself uh, not so seriously all the time, enjoy, laugh, have a little fun. Laughter is therapy for the soul. Yes. And just real quickly, what you just went over, can you just tell me one, two, three, four, five, what they were? Oh, be committed. Was number one. Uh Uh-huh. Be authentic and ethical. Number two. Be honest. Number three. Be inclusive. Number four. And number five. Ask questions. Wonderful. And can you recommend two books that every woman should read? I'm going to recommend that they read my book, my dissertation, The Sexual Practices of Black Males and Societal Myths About Them, a contemporary, a historical overview and a contemporary analysis. Because what it did, uh, what it does, it opens up the idea of us as African Americans uh, recognizing uh, that we really do matter, uh, that in order to help us, you've got to understand us. And for us not to make assumptions because I'm black, that I know the whole black experience, read my book. I think it will open incredible doors because it talks about the myths and the stereotypes about black males uh, from the way um, they have been imprisoned and shamed and guilted into uh, sometimes being put in position where they are sexless like Uncle Tom's. They can only be seen in ways that they really are not men. Um, and then the other and, book, mm-hmm. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can... <laughs> okay. Uh, and the historical overview is a historical overview of us as African Americans. And the contemporary analysis is a survey that I did on the Internet to black males that answered questions about what they desire, what they like, to put in Dr. Shape, I got to jump in. I'm so sorry. I need okay. to know your second book because we have to wrap it up. I have another my, interview. My second book is Women Who Love Too Much. Excellent. Mm-hmm. I thank you so much for taking oh, the time. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I thank you, honestly, for taking the time to give back and share your journey and passionately and candidly you know, taking the time to really share what was your journey and and how you navigated it. I I truly appreciate that. You know what, I appreciate real quick, and I know you got to go, I appreciate you interviewing me. See, because if nobody asks the questions, we don't get to give the answers. Thank God that that asks the questions. And that's what we've got to do, too. We've got to do what you do, ask questions, and then be willing to give answers. I'm grateful for sisters like you that are helping people like me that may not be famous yet, the word is yet, but yeah. I know that we will be. Well, thank you for sharing. And where can our listeners get more information about you? Uh, they can go to uh, Dr. Sadie Shafe. Uh No, they can go to vatherapist.com. Uh, uh, they can also Google me, Dr. Sadie Shafe. Uh, on Google, and uh, VA Therapist is the one that will lead them to all of my sites, and DrSadieShape.com, uh, and as well as I've um, been in, um, I did a, um, a article for Essence Magazine, the one that Jada Pickett was on. I've also did a, a health journal, an article on um, being widowed and single and coming back out and dating again. Uh, and I've also did work on EAPs, and I'm a professor at the School of Social Work at Norfolk State University, as well as a, a social work manager in the Department of Veteran Affairs, along with my practice at DQS Communications as a CEO there. Wonderful. Thank you for joining the show today, and everyone remember, lead with value and the revenue will follow. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.